Sing for Hope brings the power of the arts to those who need it most. And today, that is all of us. The pandemic has brought loneliness front and center and so many are unable to connect with anyone. So we are reaching out to them. And we're supporting our community of Broadway stars, Grammy winners, and artists from the world's great stages at a time when the industry is 95% dark. Now more than ever, your contribution means everything to Sing for Hope and the artists and communities we serve. Hello to all our lovely audience joining us today. Welcome to the 19th YSPC lecture series. Our topic of conversation today is Sing for Hope, Voicing the so Social Imagination. And we have with us our speaker, Ms. Monica Yunus, co-founding director, Sing for Hope. Our wonderful moderator today is Mr. Warner, director of the Community Arts Lab. Soprano Miss Monica Yunus is the co-founder of Sing for Hope. She has performed with the world's leading opera companies, including the Metropolitan Opera, Washington National Opera, the Zoop Festival, and recitals in Spain, Guatemala, and her native Bangladesh. She has been named a 2016 Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum, honored with the 21st Century Leaders Award as the New Yorker of the Week by NY1, and named one of the top 50 Americans in philanthropy by Town & Country. A leading voice in the artist and citizen discussion, she has performed and spoken at the Fortune's Most Powerful Women Summit, the Skoll World Forum, the Aspen Ideas Festival, and the United Nations. The daughter of Nobel laureate, Professor Mohamed Yunus, Miss um, Monica Yunus is a graduate of the Juilliard School. So as you can see, we have a super talented speaker today and we're really looking forward to hear from her. We also have our super talented moderator, Mr. Warner, who's also involved in the creative sector and concentrates on arts initiatives with a social impact and on creating international network in the field. He is the co-founder of the Community Arts Network. He has played many roles uh, in his career from co-founder of the Community Arts Network to being a CEO, an academic, and a collaborator with many renowned artists and institutions. So we're really excited for today's conversation and let's not delay this further. I would like to welcome Professor Mohamed Yunus for his welcoming remarks to start this call. Great, great session. Uh, Professor Yunus. Thank you. Thank you, Zina. Well, what can I say? Yeah, this is very important for me. It's a very unusual introducing my own daughter as the speaker. She's usually a singer, not a speaker, but she's a good speaker too. Uh, She's a superstar, that's what I can tell you. I, can't, I don't want to give you the whole bio of her, but she's a superstar, not now, right from the beginning when she was in uh, grade schools, going to school and uh, participating in all kinds of uh, competitions. And I was wondering what's happening. So she's always uh, number one and the champion in every, every competition she joined and, and continued until she went to Juilliard and finished that and immediately she became a superstar. And uh, I got the privilege of following her because she invites me into many things. The world that I never knew, world of music, world of opera, things that I never knew in my life. I got introduced to that. I enjoyed it. If I'm not doing what I do now, I'll probably offer myself as a manager for her to just to stay around and see what's going on in that world. And this, uh, the, all the superstars that uh, we hear about, uh, you see how they are interact with each other because that's the plane she works around and uh, and i have the privilege of being close to all those uh, opera so sopranos and uh, all the other stars that you have that the important thing which uh, really excites me in her work that not only she is a superstar in his own in her own uh, world mm -hmm. uh, she used her capacity and talent to bring life to the poor people and that's what uh, led to the creation of uh, Sing for Hope. That's what she will explain what it is. And on this, of the Sing for Hope, one particular thing I like, and I wait for that every summer when she just puts up so many pianos in New York City. Uh, that's the largest public arts project, as they call it. 
uh, happens every summer. And I had no idea that the uh, people love those pianos and beautifully decorated, beautifully painted, each one of them. But it's, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it looks like a, some kind of a, a toy and a beautifully wrapped and, and beautiful uh, colors and so on. Kids love it, old people love it, senior people love it, senior citizens love it, everybody loves it. So we have to kind of bring the whole city in a different context. So these are the things that uh, uh, brought her into uh, the work that she does. She will be speaking today. And I'm very happy that uh, she brings along Warner. I didn't realize that I met Warner in many occasions, but today we, I, I was telling him that uh, I have discovered him uh, reading his bio. Uh, I see we are doing the same thing. What he does, he did music, and this is precisely what we are trying to reach out to people, bring life uh, in the music world to uh, open them up for many things that is not done. Music is always taught about something ha far away from bottom people. It's not. It's very much part of the rooted in the people and the, in the heart of the people. So that's what the Warner does. And uh, um, I thank Monica for introducing him. Uh, this is now we become a team with him. Uh, we have lots of lots of work to do with, together. Thank you, Rana. So the floor is yours. Take it from here. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Abu, for that beautiful introduction and for having both Werner and I today for this incredible conversation, voicing the social imagination. But before I do some speaking, I'd actually like to start with something. As the video mentioned, Sing for Hope transforms lives through the power of the arts. That is our mission. And during these COVID pandemic times, we've had to do a lot of shifting. The stages were dark. They're just starting to open up in certain parts of the world. And during this time, we came up with an idea. And that idea was simple. We called it Sing for Hope Grams. Think of old time telephone sort of uh, um, singing telegrams that were delivered door to door. But this, in this, in this uh, version, they were delivered via Zoom. So without further ado, I'm gonna sing a little song for you. Some of you may know it. It's called Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And this is my Sing for Hope Graham to all of you watching and listening today. When all the world is a hopeless jumble and the raindrops tumble all around, heaven opens a magic lane. When all the clouds darken up the skyway, there's a rainbow highway to be found. Leading from your window pane to a place behind the sun, just a step beyond the road. Somewhere over the rainbow, way There's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue And the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where the troubles melt like lemon drops away beyond the chimney tops. That's why all is right in me. Why then, oh, why 
can die. If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? Wow, wow. What a beautiful start into this. And I, I was just thinking, Monica, this, this is how all sessions should start. We have so many online sessions and so many Zoom meetings with so many people because it lifts us up. I, I guess it's Absolutely. the first move of how the arts, or in this case, especially music, can lift us up. But first of all, I want to say thank you for, for this wonderful performance. And of course, I feel very much privileged that you brought me in, as Professor Yunus said, and of course I'm privileged and honored to be part of this uh, series uh, as a moderator. So I'm, I'm the one raising the questions or let's say we, we, we try to go into a dialogue. Monica, you have done so many things. Of course, we have heard you started with Sing for Hope and then the famous pianos into the public. And then the grams, you just uh, did the gram for us, which was beautiful. But then also the whole topic of, you know, COVID came up and, and, and you started new endeavors. And in COVID, we saw a bit of, and, and I'm curious how, how you feel about it and how people, you saw a bit of, a, I would even say a contradictory view on the arts or music. On one hand, we saw it all the time in all social media and we saw the singing Italians out of the balconies for the others and you started amazing programs. On the other hand, we still saw that when it came to regulation that the art sector was not treated well, even though there was, you could say another proof that this is a basic language. We're not talking about, you know, a nice to have. What is your view and, and what did you start especially also in these times during COVID? Absolutely, and thank you for bringing that up. I'm so delighted that we're in this conversation together. As I said, when we were started, that this is not so much about, you know, me, uh, dominating a conversation, but conversation includes this network. And that's what I love so much about having you in this, is that you are such a, um, a, a beacon of that network that we are trying to build. And particularly for artists and artists in a, in a post COVID world, what does that mean? I think that, um, you know, yes, it's true that artists were sort of the last to be thought of in the, um, the, 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 the COVID times. I have many friends and colleagues who really until recently, even until now are not working. They have absolutely no opportunity to deliver their art, something that they've spent their entire lives cultivating. And yet we live in, an, in a society, globally speaking, that needs that art not only for a luxury or entertainment purposes, but fundamentally for well-being. And we see that again and again. And this is the sort of um, the basis on which Sing for Hope was founded. A, myself and my dear fellow co-founder and soprano Camille Zamora, um, you know, 16 years ago, we were just students at Juilliard, but we knew that art has a powerful platform. And yet it was, it was being used in many, many different ways, but it wasn't necessarily always at the table with politics and economics. And I know, Werner, we spoke about that many years ago when we met, and I'm delighted to say that I think uh, right now, in many ways, a light has been shown, shown on that very thing, which is that artists have a unique power to transform, to heal, to uplift and enliven. And this COVID moment, as my father likes to say, there is no going back. And for artists, I feel that that's very, very much the case. There is no going back. Who among the artists has transformed, has pivoted? They are the leaders in that right now. You know, if you can't be on a stage, we'll deliver it via Zoom. If you can't be in the theater, we'll figure out 15 different ways to, to mash uh, uh, all these little Zoom boxes and create a play. The creativity and the um, innovation is core to being an artist because there are no guarantees in this work of creation. And I think that's a very important point. And that's something that we have lived these 16 months at Sync for Hope. How do we innovate? 
And you were very innovative, just, just because you said how to innovate. You were very flexible during this period. It's, as I said, it's not just, not just, it's a beautiful endeavor what you do with the pianos. And then you also go into schools and go into hospitals and via, via the grams, you bring it now um, virtually into uh, people's homes. But you have done other things too. Let us know a little bit more. And then we talk about creativity and those. Yes, absolutely. So I'll start with, I, I wanted to start this conversation with the Sing for Hope Graham because that is how we started. Um, we, we, you know, we were not able to go into hospitals as we used to do in pre-pandemic times. We were not able to go into schools, children were home. And so we started to think about how can we um, access artists and connect them with communities who really truly need them. And so our first sort of product, if you will, was the Sync for Hope Gram. And it was very simply that people would fill out an order form, they would pay for this singing telegram of sorts, a Sing for Hope Gram. And we would then also, a major pivot for us as an organization, would pay the artist. Everything before the pandemic was volunteer based. Every artist that worked for Sing for Hope in the before times was a volunteer. They came to trainings, they went into hospitals, they went into schools, they painted those pianos, those incredible Sing for Hope artist designed pianos out of their love for the public art project that was being done. During this time, we made a very conscious choice that artists, particularly, in, in, I'm sure globally speaking, absolutely, but I can point to a very critical, um, a very, very critical data point in the United States. According to Americans for the Arts, 95% of artists were underemployed or completely unemployed during this time. That's a staggering statistic. And so we made the choice, even though we had not budgeted for it and we didn't know where it would come from, that we would pay the artists for that. So Sing for Hope Grams was a model where we paid the artists to deliver this three to five minute, really musical connection point. And it was a wonderful thing. It went very successfully. We had many people buying them and many artists employed because of it. It wasn't an enormous amount of money for the artists, but it was something in this time when they needed to connect and they needed to be paid for that connection. So this was one sort of um, pivot that we made very early on in the pandemic. And it still continues today. We delivered Sing for Hope Grams for Father's Day this past weekend here in the United States. We've delivered Sing for Hope Grams as far away as New Zealand, trying to figure out all of the, all of the, uh, the technology and the time differences. And it was a, a, a bit of a technical feat for us, an organization that was not in the business of, of trying to figure out the tech platforms and aspects of it. But like you said, artists are flexible. They're innovative and they're able to sort of figure things out because they're they're creatively engaged. So that was just, you know, that was one of our first pivots. And then in terms of um, our other major, uh, major project that we've just celebrated 100 days at the Javits Center. And that's something that I, you know, would love to love to talk about. And I think you were referencing. Sing for Hope had seven days a week programming at the Javits Center. The Javits Center is one of the largest, if not the largest vaccination site in the United States. Located in New York City, they have tens of thousands of people going through their doors to get COVID vaccines. So as this was in process and as there was an, an, enormous, um, an, an enormous opportunity for us to bring artists into that space, as you probably know, you have to sit and wait once you've received the vaccine for 15 minutes. That's a very nerve wracking 15 minutes to wonder, oh, will my arm swell up? Will I have a bad reaction? And for people like me who don't like needles, this can be very, very nerve wracking. Plus you're going into a center where it's almost like an airport. You're standing on a line, you're waiting to give your information, you have your little card. It's a process that can bring up a lot of emotion. So what we did at Sing for Hope is we went to the leadership at Javits, who was incredibly welcoming to us. And we said, listen, we have the best artists in New York City and in, in the country who are dying to come in and are dying to perform. Can we make a partnership? Which we did. And so we just celebrated 100 days. We're over that marker now. 100 days of seven day a week programming that employed over 300 artists 
Um, every day there were three to five artists in Javits Center playing from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So for two hours every day, we had wonderful instrumentalists, violinists, pianists, um, cajon, uh, violists, cellists, harp, you name it, all kinds of instruments who would come in and play music from Bach to Broadway tunes to Katy Perry and everything in between. And as the people sat there for their 15 minutes, they were enjoying this music. And the thing that happened, which was so exciting for us, is that the doctors and the nurses came to us and they said, why aren't you here longer? We said, oh, what, how, how is it affecting people? And they said, well, it's very clear to us that we get less patient anxiety uh, calls during that time. Our work goes down because of the live music that Sing for Hope is bringing to the Javits Center. There are less uh, calls for panic attacks, um, anxiety attacks. So this is something that we're extremely proud of. And we are um, in the process of working with the New York Department of, of Health to quantify that in a study. So we're just awaiting their confirmation for that. But very exciting. I still get goosebumps because I saw a feature and I, I guess we see something later. But um, just on this, on this topic, arts and health, also because in my view, it had so many beautiful ingredients of, of the power of the arts. And if I say ingredients, there is the beauty. And even Pope Francis recently uh, gave a lecture about the beauty and the arts delivering beauty to the world that we all, and I'm saying deliberately, all need beauty in our life. This is one. The other thing is you, you pay the artist, you mentioned it by the way, which is also giving value to something like paying, buying in, like social entrepreneurs or social businesses who then have, have actually a value by pricing a product. And I think this is something which is very often lacking, by the way, in, in, the, field of, in the field of arts. And you, you have done this. And the other thing is you make arts with this amazing thing accessible to everybody. But going back to the, to, to the power of the arts for health, as you said, there are, you know, the doctors, what they, they, they uh, gave us feedback, but they're already like in UK and in other countries, and you know those things, social prescription, using the arts, using music, especially as a therapy form. And I guess it's also a little bit of future in, for, for patients, for long COVID patients. Um, and I don't know how you see it, but it's also proof or another proof that this is not a luxury. This is not something, okay, a wonderful singing Monica on a screen and it's a nice to have, and it's a beautiful starting point. It's more, it is. Absolutely, it absolutely. That's, I think that's really the crux of it. If we're talking about voicing the social imagination, that is the imagination that I have, which is that people, not just in the UK, who seem to be further ahead in this, art, in this arts in health concept, that the social prescribing of listening to music three times a day will have this health outcome. And that's when the hospital administrations and, uh, you know, healthcare the, the healthcare industry as a whole starts to wake up and say, oh, this is absolutely something that will improve our health outcomes. And I think that's very exciting, is that you're seeing that um, burgeoning field really start to flourish. It's flourishing in the UK. The social subscribing is, excuse me, social prescribing is already very much in place. Um, and particularly, as you said, for long COVID, this is something that's extremely important. I know the UK has a wonderful culture of choirs. And for singers during COVID, it was particularly difficult. And it was particularly difficult because the idea that when you sing, there are many more aerosols that are released into the air. So if you have a group of 10, 15, 20, 100 people standing shoulder to shoulder and singing together, it is very much therapeutic, but it is also dangerous when the threat of spread was such, uh, was such an issue. So for example, I say, I, um, I'm a, uh, an artist lecturer at Carnegie Mellon University and all the universities that have schools of music had a very difficult time. How can I teach my students when I can't be in the same room with them and they can't sing? So this was also sort of a, um, a very difficult uh, thing to maneuver. How do we do this? 
Um, and so many choirs in some communities, the only outlet for togetherness, particularly elders, um, but also youth, it was a very difficult thing. So um, it's, it's a wonderful, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be in a choir. I know that that is one of the social prescriptions that is um, handed out. And I think that it's incredible to breathe together as one does in a choir. It's incredible to have the experience of singing together. And again, the health outcomes for things like choirs. I only use choirs as an example. It's, there are so many other, other ways, whether you play an instrument, whether you sing together, whether you write songs together, there is um, so much data about how that improves health outcomes. And I'm excited that this is something that's hitting many universities now, certainly in the United States. And I think it will be long-term not only will it be wonderful for the long haul COVID um, patients, but it will also, I think, open up the field even wider to have high level artists, and this is important, high level artists going into a field where they feel um, you know, adequately paid, um, embedded into community, and have the kind of outcomes, health outcomes, community connection outcomes that we want to be seeing with this work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's beautifully described. Even here in Austria, we have now the first pilots going on for these low, long COVID patients. And actually, they, the doctors or the health system, they lack measures. And, and they say, now the most important thing, as you described, it's really all about breathing. And the most beautiful, and again, I use deliberately beautiful, the word beauty. It's not just breathing as such. It's really like breathing with beauty and also breathing uh, as you describe it, uh, beautiful with somebody else in a choir. It's this togetherness. That's very often we describe all these kind of initiatives. Uh, it, it's twofolded. One, it's for the individual well-being, as you described it. But the other thing is, it has, as you also described it, an immense community, an immense social cohesion uh, effect. And that's why um, maybe turning a bit into more a society level. Um, Sing for Hope, you have it in the title. I mean, and I guess one of the things we all lack uh, in these strange and weird times, and also even before with all the crisis we had, is hope. And it's interesting, even from a business point of view, an economy point of view, that hope is the only driver no, for investments, they would say. And, and, we, and, and the business people would say, and I'm going now a, a little bit into economy and business, they would say, and talk about rematching. We have to rematch. We have to think out of the box. We have to give people hope so that, or, or the economy hope so that they would invest. We have to um, be, create, be creative. But very often they don't think about the artists or that the arts initiatives could serve as thinkers out of the box, being bridge builders, giving hope worldwide. Well, I don't know why, because I think um, I, I, I like to be hopeful, <laughs> speaking of hope. And so I like to think that that um, that is changing. I think that there's such a drive to outcomes and data collection that sometimes the focus becomes so incredibly laser focused that one doesn't have the sort of holistic um, view of what it means to be in community. Um, whether it's a corporation or a nonprofit or a community group, there's still a core of people at the center of it. And so if you don't address that holistically, I think somewhere down the line, you will have issues. I mean, it is why corporations have large, you know, HR departments and team building exercises. And, you know, uh, you know speaking of of team building, we had many companies that came to Sync for Hope to say, do you do these Sync for Hope grams for team meetings? Could we do it for our team? You know, I know our team really loves, they really miss going to the theater. They miss this. Can you have a Broadway singer come to us? Can you have an opera singer come to us? Could you have a cellist come to us? Why? Because we're humans <laughs> and we have other needs besides just, um, you know, the data output that is relied upon to drive companies forward. Um, it's, it's the same throughout the world, that doesn't change. So I think, again, I, I am hopeful that because there are so many 
organizations, universities that are trying to meld the data with the holistic humanities aspects of what organizations like Sync for Hope. And again, even that, uh, today we're talking about Sync for Hope, but there are so many in the network, speaking of networks, that are doing this kind of work. And that brings me great joy and excitement because I think it's a sort of very tiny turning of the ship, you know, and it's a big sh ship to turn when we're talking about the arts industry as a whole. I think many, whether you're an opera company, a dance company, uh, a, a theater company, the arts as a whole are looking to see how can we embed ourselves in community, just like corporations and nonprofits are looking to see how can we take care of our people. If we don't take care of our people, we don't have, you know, the talent that we need to drive those outputs. So it's, it's very, very much uh, symbiotic. And I, I think that that's something that you see companies that are um, paying attention to this because let's face it, in the conversations that I've had, many top tier corporations, their productivity is, is just as high as it was pre-COVID in, in some cases higher. So what is it that's missing? The, the, hum, the human aspect is something that still needs to be embedded. Otherwise, you, know, you're, you will lose that talent. That talent will go elsewhere because they're, they're not being addressed from the sort of humanities perspective. Yeah, I, I, I especially like also you refer to be hopeful. I'm hopeful too. There is a, a nice quote of a famous community choreographer who got famous because of, of a big documentary. And he always said, there is the possibility of hope. And I think we should be hopeful, that's one. And I think we see it already also, as you mentioned it, there is a demand. I deliberately call it, there is a demand. Uh, we see that in our community arts network, for instance, there is a big demand, not just, not just what we talked about arts and health and as, as health measures, it, there is a big demand when it comes to the well-being of individual in businesses, you know, what to do, uh, building up wires and things like that. There is another big demand because of the urgency of the topic, especially in the whole topic of climate change. Because there is such an urgency and, and, and there we see something, you know, that all we have all the data, scientists have all the data, everything is there. And we had immense expensive communications about it and still it didn't work and it didn't really move the people to change their behavior. Now it is interesting for me to see that actually they came, they came to us demanding artists for a, 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 a translation, an artistic translation of the topic into the hearts and the minds of the people because they realized it didn't work yet. So we are seeing this coming and demanding from different angles. And I guess this is, this is really beautiful. And, and I think we have to work on this. And, and you mentioned another topic, the data topic. Um, the data, we have already a lot of evaluations of the power of initiatives and yours and, and things like that, but it's very fragmented. And I think there is no, and that was another motivation for us to also work with you and work with these initiatives to bring them together and bring these evaluations in, in a readable or visible, um, more visible or client-friendly way to to the people and to the politicians, to those who can influence and those who have the power to change. But there is a demand. Do you see that demand too? Do you see the demand in education? We talk Absolutely. a lot about education and, and social emotional learning. Sometimes I feel they talk about it and peace and everything, but they don't demand the arts, even though who else can bring social emotional learning to the kids? Yeah. So, many, so many things to unpack there, Werner, because you make such a terrific um, number of points just in that statement. Um, first of all, I think that health is 80 to 90% of the social determinants of health are sort of where you live, access to water, how you, if you have access to education, it's so much less about sort of chronic health things and it's much more about, you know, staying, staying healthy, you know? And so how do we sort of frame that? And again, to me, it's about a, a humanities aspect, right? Um, I think that many times <laughs> the arts are kind of the, the, um, the ignored cousin of science and math. And this is something that I very much want to work against because again, the ideas that, you know, we're having these 
very important conversations, whether it's climate, whether any of the topics of the SDGs, right? And I think it's interesting that the arts address so many of the SDGs, but it hasn't necessarily been voiced in that way. It's sort of like way down the page. And so when the SDGs were announced, you know, we took a very bold decision, which was we wanted to align ourselves with, um, with some of the SDGs that we felt strongly about and, the, and that through our work we were addressing. Education, good education, good health and well-being, um, sustainable communities and sustainable cities and communities. Now, I think if you can frame all the organizations that we're working with on this call, everyone represents some, some, some field that the SDGs address. If you can reframe what your organization is doing to be helpful in your small community to those SDGs, that's already a great step. And it also forces you to sort of articulate how it is you're doing that work. So I'm doing this work at Sing for Hope for health and well being. How I want to make sure that people, when they're receiving their vaccines, and this is, you know, yes, this is a, a, a finite amount of time, but most likely there will be uh, additional. Um, you know, shots in the future that you'll have to take and why not include artists in that in that moment. It's a community driving thing to have the arts embedded. S similarly, what you're talking about with climate, you know, th they're coming to you because they need artists to translate and make make it known in different ways. And I think that's something that artists do so well is they're able to translate things. One of the things, again, I, I referenced it before, that I'm most excited about is the sort of translation that will happen between public health, public policy, and the arts. If they can come together, I think they will very much help community health. That's another big focus of ours at Sync for Hope. And those studies, those courses of studies to help equip the next level, the next, you know, the 21st century artist to come out of their school program, they will understand how to do that. And it's not to downplay the importance of having our theaters be active community centers. It is just an additive way of looking at the arts holistically and ensuring that once again, the arts, artists and arts are not put to the side as something that's a, you know, a, a luxury, as you say, but it's something that is, that is vital and that has to be incorporated into education from the youngest youngest children. And, and the beauty is, and I've seen programs, they seem now in, if they have really integrated arts or in the public education systems, like in primary schools, they sing now earth songs or songs for the yeah. earth and they socialize their parents. And of course, as we all know that the, the neuroscience is very clear, uh, experience is more important than information. Still our school system, I think it's 90% information. So we don't, follow at all the, the latest scientists. And okay. I like also the mix, as you said. And, and, and I've seen these small children then talking and, and forcing their parents to do something against climate change. So I like what you mentioned also, this mix of, of arts and science, and you already started the conversation into the whole advocacy part. What can we do that what you do is also really integrated? I very often talk about is part of the game. You know, part of the bigger games, the bigger games in sense of businesses, all these important topics, the basic topics as health for everyone. Um, what can we do together? I would also say, as as we building, have built up a network, and you are doing this um, to really bring those important, and you're doing it, uh, of course. But but still, what what we sh should do even more to bring it on those tables that art is embedded, uh, not as a you know, that the delegated things once a, a month or once a year, we go to the theater or so, or we do something artistically, rather than being part of the game, sitting as an emancipated voice on these decision tables. What can we do? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think, um, first of all, something that artists are really uh, good at is they, they get into the habit of being uncomfortable. And many, many of these conversations are uncomfortable. It's sort of a, it's an exercise in speaking truth to power, which is not easy, 
We're seeing, we're seeing that all over the world in so many different ways, the, the health disparities, the racial disparities. But the first step is to be uncomfortable and to say something. And so whether it's you know, a very small thing to a very large thing, it's about each person's capacity to, you know, it's an old adage, be the change that you wanna see in the world. And sometimes that's so large and it feels so big. But I think that, you know, part of it is being able to speak up and to voice that social imagination. What is it that you want to see out there? You know, what is it that, you know, if you have children, are you having those conversations with your kids? Sometimes, I mean, it's amazing. I have a six-year-old son and speaking to him about what he would like to see is fascinating because still the imagination is so live. And so my first sort of uh, exercise would be to really try to unlock that. And instead of saying, oh, it won't work. It can't, we can't do that. It'll never work. They won't do this. I can't do that. How about saying I can do that? How about figuring out what are the small things that you can do? Because look, there's no, the, it, it, there are limited, limited, uh, unlimited rather, unlimited activities for people, unlimited organizations for people to be involved in. And I think it just depends on how it is that you are personally engaged. One thing that I know at, at Sing for Hope that Camille and I do is we, we love to have conversations with other organizations that are doing similar work. Because again, it comes down to the network. Nobody needs to be working in silos. And yes, sometimes it's hard to enter an organization because they have a slightly different way of doing things, but the coming together and really forming a network and understanding who else in your state country is doing that kind of work and how can you connect and setting aside time to see what those points of connections are. You know, I didn't really even realize that there were multiple organizations that are really trying to tackle arts in health and to be in conversation with those organizations is extremely important. But I think some people, they, they really tend to um, focus on the day-to-day -day. and during this pandemic time, it's almost enough to, to keep your head above water, whether it's personally or professionally or organizationally. And so it, it's, it, it requires a good deal of, of focus and um, determination. But I think, you know, that's why I'm so excited, frankly, about this conversation is that here we are, we're in conversation and we're in connection, Werner, because I, I, I wanna turn the, the conversation to Ken the Community Arts Network, which you are driving and with your wonderful team. And we're just happy to be part of that network, Sing for Hope being part of the CAN network and in conversation so that we can bridge the, you know, the gap between the, um, the across the miles to, to be closer together in our work and to focus the efforts uh, that so many of us are trying to do within the artistic lane, but also to sort of elbow our way into all of the other lanes that seem to want to ignore the, uh, the role of the 21st century artists in creating a better world. Yes, and I think we are grateful too, because the, the network actually is dependent on, on open-minded initiatives and open-minded artists like you are to really join forces to again, put this topic on the power tables into the field of education, field of business and so on and so forth. And you mentioned uh, a very important, and I saw it also as a question in the chat, you know, the topic of art and transformation. Sometimes I use also the argument you were, you were saying, you know, very often the art, it's not just thinking, the artists are not just thinking out of the box. They are very often, I'm not allowed to say a pain in, but they are very often also the ones who really show other ways at least. Yeah. And there, I think literally there has been no evolution or real society revolution without art. I think of the falling of the, the wall in, uh, um, in, in Eastern Europe, think of uh, Black Lives Matter. I think that, that never ever you would have seen. And in education, sometimes I argue, it's funny, you know, I argue with our education people in the foundation and say, have you, when you talk about education, not talk about the arts, there's something missing. You wouldn't find any philosopher who wouldn't talk about arts with uh, or business without talking, um, sorry, about education without talking about the arts. It's for them integrated. We just disintegrated those things. So I'm, I'm really happy that, that we joined forces in this and I'm very grateful with it because there was the question of arts and transformation or archivism that's a new term which came up and 
and we try to support this, but we are definitely, uh, of course, dependent on, on very diverse, very from small to larger institutions also who really say we have to change this. And we have also, I say this, I mean, that's also beautiful what you do, you change, you're very flexible. That's what sometimes we miss from bigger institutions. And then I hope I don't miss one. We have to talk also about um, the open art uh, topic. And I, yes. but I, I leave it now to you. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, one, one thing on the, on the topic of artivism, that's one other um, lecture series that in partnership with the Gutzman Library, Libraries, Teachers College, Columbia University, Ad Adelphi University, and Sing for Hope, we started a lecture program that meets every Monday. And that too has been a place for artists, artists, activists to tell their stories. And again, in the sense of network, in the sense of spreading the joy of what others are doing so that we can be in connection. This was also another wonderful opportunity that came on our radar. We were very excited to, to um, be a partner in this artivism um, lecture series. So that was one other thing that came out of this time. Um, the other thing that I did wanna to just touch base on and thank you for, for mentioning that, uh, Werner, was that, you know, as, as the pandemic does what it's gonna do, and in certain places, things are opening back up. In other places, it's still a you know, disaster situation. And so I think that we will be in this kind of uh, difficult scenario for quite a while. And even after it is, uh, you know, let's say people are vaccinated and, and in all parts of the world, they feel comfortable being in community again, what happens to the people that don't get to leave their elder care facility, the hospital? You know, they're there for treatment for a long time. The, th the things that we were trying to address as an organization beforehand will continue, unfortunately, because that is the state, the state of the world. So we were trying to figure out if we can't be in hospitals, if we can't be in schools, how do we still access those audiences? How do we do that? And so once again, we turn to technology and this you know, wonderful thing called, called Zoom, and we created something called Open Arts. And I wonder if um, we can show the quick little video about this platform now, thank you. Open Arts is a free online arts platform that offers live performances featuring the brightest stars of Broadway, opera, and the world's leading stages. The nonprofit Sing for Hope created Open Arts as part of its mission to provide arts for all and to bring hope, healing, and connection to millions of people around the world. Open Arts gives you a front row seat to over 100 live performances each month with a wide variety of programming available for all ages. The easy to use interactive website connects you directly with the artists and to other audience members from across the country. There is no cost to access the site or to watch any of our performances. 100% of all donations go directly to support our artists. Experience the arts live and up close and connect with other art lovers today at Open Arts. So again, to reach the audiences in elder care facilities, to reach those who aren't able to travel, to reach those in schools, parents who are still trying to teach their children on, on, <laughs> from home. We created this platform so that people could go to it at the prescribed times of day and watch a Broadway performer sing. They could watch somebody who is with, with a, it's not, um, it's not necessarily arts therapy, but we have a dear friend who is an arts therapist who was providing and had a group for long COVID survivors. And how are they working together and just a, a safe space for them to connect and talk about what they're experiencing. We have painting classes. We have, you know, uh, wonderful stories being read to children in the morning. So this is really a calendar that anyone can access. It is free and all you have to do is sign up and look at the calendar. And then after the performance, you can even talk directly to the artist and ask them questions. Um, right now, the time zones are very much US-based, but we are hoping to expand the offerings to accommodate in you know, our global community. And this was our way of saying, okay, let's try it. Let's see how it works. And let's see, again, we're paying the artists for their time. These are wonderful artists who are not necessarily yet 
able to go back to work. Some of them are, some of them are not. This is one way to connect. And so we're very um, excited about where open arts will be. And it's not to say that when we, won't, we, when we are able that we won't be going back in person, but if you want to talk about silver linings, this is one of those times where you go, okay, well, we are able to look at things from a hybrid perspective. I, I really adore your flexible approach. And I think you show uh, to be innovative, which we're talking also a lot about innovation also in, in the business world too. We have to wrap up, I see. Um, I'm, for me, this is also, Literally, when I when I was hearing now this example and also the grams, it reminded me a, a little bit about lullabies, you know, like this yeah. beauty, beauty which comes to you. And I, even in this conversation, I was thinking when, when I was listening to you, how come that we di don't realize that the arts or music is actually our common basic language? It's something which we have to learn as a language. You know, we have to learn languages in schools, and I guess we should also learn to sing with each other because. As you uh, in the video, you see even the family connection, and how can it be? And you can be connected with people who don't speak your language via singing together or via even yeah. But anyway, if if I would ask you the last question because I saw also and this is so much linked to the work of your father. Do I have to say because the, I saw the words dreaming, reimagination, um, um, yeah, especially these words creativity. We talked upon, touched upon. My last question, and then we, I, I give it back to the beautiful people uh, from the UNO Center is, what is your personal biggest dream in all this? Oh, wow. Um, you know, one I think- <laughs> One minute. <laughs> one minute, okay. Um, well, I think continuing to voice the social imagination. I, I mean, if, if I had to say it very briefly, obviously there were so, there are so many bullet points in that. I think what I'm excited about is bringing the artist to the forefront in this next, you know, in these next times. I'm excited that there are universities who are exploring this and making the pairing. Because as you said, you know, we learn languages, Artists need to learn the language of public health and public policy and, and, and public policymakers. And uh, ex they, they need to be able to translate those conversations because at the end of the day, I think that we are doing similar work. It's about being able to um, create something together that forwards the thinking of how to continue to build communities. And, and that's very exciting to me. Thank you so much, Monica, for this oh, very thank you, Werner. Thank you. Insights also and what you do. And and one can literally feel your passion in it. And you're also, and I call it now fight that this becomes something part of the game. And and with this, thank you so much. And I'm I'm, I'm really privileged to have this conversation with you. And I give it back now to our wonderful friends from the UNO Center. I think it's the time. Thank you so much for thank you. Thank all you. these insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. First, I would like to um, thank Monica Apu and a big round of applause for your wonderful, wonderful opening um, piece. Um, indeed, as uh, Mr. Werner said that um, um, I wish all of our lecture series opened up like this and it really refreshes, you know, um, you even after a tiring day, you know, listening to music really makes you feel good. I was just thinking, you know, at times of stress, I'm not going over like the definition of quantum physics, physics or anything, you know, at that time, some like light music or what, whatever, that is what refreshes you. And, you know, at a time when there's so much, um, you know, chaos in the world due to the pandemic, uh, healing through music um, is important. And I, as you rightly said, there's so many ways um, uh, that can be done. And Zoom being one of the platform technology helping us and really, really wonderful to see the ways you are reaching out to people in the hospitals and offering such services like the platform you just showed. Um, I will definitely check it out. And I also request our audience to check it out. As you uh, mentioned, it's a free platform and uh, it's open for all. And we look forward to um, enjoying all the um, you know, music and arts and everything that's on the platform. So thank you for introducing us to all that. Um, and um, it really has been a wonderful conversation and we look forward to continuing this. Um, this lecture series is for our 
for all of our audience members, especially the students from uh, the YSBC's universities. Many students are not being able to go to college, but are doing classes from home. And I'm sure there are a lot of music and art students here. And if um, these uh, Sing for Hope's activities and the activities she mentioned are of your interest, do connect with us. I'm sure uh, Monica was always ready to help and um, uh, she will be able to assist us and you'll see her and of course Mr. Warner in our future events. Um, so Sing for Hope, uh, singforhope.org is the website to check out. Please do check it out and stay connected with our activities. Um, thank you very, very much again. We're really, really honored to have both of you in this conversation and look forward to having everyone again back in Social Business Day, which is coming very, very soon uh, on June 20th. 28th is uh, the starting day of Social Business Day. It's going to be five days this time. Um, we're going to have them primarily virtual, and it's going to be uh, um, continuing over continuous happening over these five days. And you'll be able to watch them on our social uh, business PDM. You'll get the links and the Zoom links will be also on our websites. So now I request the tech team to kindly play a slideshow uh, on Social Business Day and our upcoming events. Until then, thank you very, very much. Um, we look forward to having everyone back again in our upcoming events. Thank you very much and bye bye for now. Thank you very much everyone see you again soon join us for social business day coming in on june